Please turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and today we'll be looking verses 24 through 28. As we've been working through this great chapter on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and, and as that resurrection is indissolubly connected to the crucifixion of, of Jesus Christ, we've, we've been considering what was accomplished by Jesus' resurrection and thus also what was accomplished by his death. And because theologians don't get advanced degrees without making novel arguments, there's a number of competing theories of the atonement or theories of the crucifixion, of, of what exactly was accomplished on the cross of Christ. There's, I think, by far the, the lowest of those theories is that Jesus' death was merely as a moral example to us, popular among, primarily uh, started in Germany, but liberal mainland Protestants. That Jesus was just showing how much he loved us and how much God loves us and how much we ought to love one another. Another view, um, we could get in the deep weeds here, but, but it's the idea that Jesus' death was a ransom paid for sins, which if you say he was a ransom paid to Satan, you're in error if you see him as a ransom paid to the Father, then you're right. Um, which leads into a, another view very similar to that called uh, substitutionary atonement or penal substitutionary atonement. When Jesus suffered a penalty for sin in the place of sinners reconciling us to God. And there's another view uh, called, they have to use Latin because it sounds fancier that way, Christus Victor, uh, Christ Victorious. And the problem with these competing theories is generally not in so much what they claim, but in what they leave out. Jesus' death was a moral example for us. Peter writes that he suffered as an example, that we should walk in his steps. The problem is if you say it was only a moral example. And, and clearly, on, on every page of the New Testament, we see Christ's death as an atoning sacrifice for us. In, in Hebrews, uh, we, we read so much about how Jesus, as both the high priest and the lamb, without blemish, has, has for all time put away sin by the sacrifice of, of himself. But Jesus' death and resurrection was also a victory, a victory over his enemies. And it's, it's that that we see in our text today. Jesus victorious. Jesus shall reign. Before we read the text before we see how Jesus conquers his enemies. Will you pray with me? Father, we rejoice in the victory of Jesus Christ over all his foes. We know from your word that we too were once enemies of Christ, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, unwilling and unable to submit to your law. Your victory, your son's victory, has left us not dead but alive, has made us friends and heirs, has bestowed upon us all the glorious riches of your gospel. 
And so, Father, we pray this morning that you would help us to grasp the beauty of the divine conquest. That we would rejoice in the kingdom of your Son. That we would rejoice to be conquered by the Galilean. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, our text, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 through 28. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. This is the word of our Lord. So in this, this paragraph that we are picking up in the middle of, Paul has just talked about how Jesus Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. Christ is the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ, then comes the end. So, so after Jesus' coming, his second coming, after the resurrection of all those who belong to Christ, then comes the end. The end of the story. Right? There, there's a reason why fairy tales almost always end, at least our Disney versions of fairy tales, and they all lived happily ever after. And what those fairy tales wish were true is genuinely true for the Christian, that, that we will live happily ever after. And it's, it's the end of the story. It's, it's not the end of time. It's not the end of existence, but, but it is the end of the narrative that began with the creation of the world. It, it's the end of, of history. It's the full establishment and deliverance of the kingdom of God. Where Christ rules over all. Where there, there is no opposition, there, there is no enemies left. You see in verse 24 that, that Christ delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. And, and then verse 25 explains upon that, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And then verse 26 says that these enemies aren't going to just be diminished or, or weakened. They're going to be destroyed. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So, so what are these rules and authorities and powers? It's, it's, it's everything that's opposed to God. It's everything that's opposed to His power and His might and His rule. In, in a word, it's sin. But I think it can help us to consider sinfulness in, in three categories. And, and these categories, they all have a great deal to do with each other. But I think it's helpful for us to think about them this way. We, 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 don't, need to, we don't need to worry about, you know, well, are, are, are some of these powers like certain spiritual demonic forces? And who exactly are they? The right, Bible doesn't name any demons uh, besides Satan and one more in, in Leviticus. Um, I guess legion, if you count that as one demonic name. 
or a collective of demons. But all, all the powers of, of darkness are gathered under the authority of Satan. So the first enemy, when I say first, in the order that we're talking about them, not that they're in some kind of preeminence or order that they're going to be defeated. But, but first, you see, Satan is conquered. Jesus conquers Satan. Jesus defeats and, and even destroys Satan. If you look at Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14, the author writes, Since therefore that the children share in flesh and blood, Jesus himself likewise partook of the same things of flesh and blood, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. So the devil has the power of death, and, and yet through dying, Jesus has defeated him. Several of, of the church fathers in the first few century, centuries of, of the church use the same image of, of, our, of the devil as a, as a ravenous fish, almost. And in Jesus, in his incarnation, as bait. And, and the fish has seized upon him. The bay saw this opportunity. Here's God made flesh, and flesh dies, and I have the power of death, and I have this opportunity to destroy, or he thinks, to destroy deity. But when he swallows the bait, the bait consumes the fish. Somehow, the power of Jesus Christ, through dying, he has destroyed the one who has the power of death. Because he'll, he'll destroy death himself. Death itself. Satan is, is described with, with two different adjectives throughout Scripture. Two specific things that, that he does that makes him an enemy of God and an enemy of, of the people of God. He's, he's called the tempter and he's called the accuser. We, we, see Jesus, we see Satan called the accuser. I'm sorry, I'm getting all sorts of out of order. He's called the accuser in Zechariah and in Revelation 14. He's called the tempter in, in Matthew chapter 4, but we also see him at work tempting as early as Genesis chapter 3. And Satan is always waging war against God through temptations. He, he comes in the form of a serpent to Adam and Eve and, and just sidles right up to Eve. And, Did God really say this? Did he really say that you couldn't eat any of the fruit of the garden? That, that seems rough. Right, and it's not what God said at all. He's trying to sow seeds of, of doubt and mistrust. And then when the woman responds to the serpent that, you know, well, we can, we can eat everything except this one tree, the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So on the day that we eat that, then we'll die. And what does Satan say? You will not surely die. As God knows that on the day when you eat it, you will become like God. Knowing good from evil. And, and so Satan is, is tempting Adam and Eve to doubt the veracity of God's word and to, not, to doubt the goodness of God's character. Oh, well, he doesn't have your best interests at heart. If you trust me, I'm your friend. And he still does that today. Over and over and over again. Not necessarily in that cartoon image that we have of, of you know, there's, there's an angel sitting on one shoulder and a devil sitting on the other shoulder whispering in your ears. But he's constantly leading us through, through the world, through the sinfulness of our flesh, and, and sometimes just through direct spiritual demonic 
influence to doubt God's word and to doubt God's goodness. And to say, you know, you're married to a sinner. Don't you think life would be a whole lot easier if you just went ahead and got a divorce? If, if God really cared about your happiness, wouldn't he say that it's okay? Or he says, you know, money's kind of tight. Inflation is getting out of, out of control. Do you really think it's a good use of, of your, your income to give so much of it to support the ministry of the word? I mean, you've got bills to pay and mouths to feed. Think about all the better uses you could make of your time on, on Sundays. You could make more money. And then you could do more things. Or in, in whatever way. He's, he's constantly tempting us. So, well, yeah, God said that, but this is how things really are. This is how you can be happy. This is how you can be healthy. This is how you can be successful. Don't listen to God. Listen to me. So he tempts us. And, and Eve listened to the temptation, and she ate. And Adam listened to his wife, and he ate. And it turned out that everything the serpent said was a lie. Everything that God had said was the truth. And he, he tempted Jesus in, in the same way in the wilderness in, in Matthew chapter 4 when Jesus has been fasting for 40 days. And Satan comes to him. And, you know, paraphrasing here a little bit. But, you know, 40 days of fasting, Jesus. Wow, you must be hungry. You know, there's not any food out here in the wilderness, but we've got these rocks. If you're the Son of God, I mean, can't you just command these stones to become bread? Wouldn't your Father want you to be well fed and cared for? He doesn't want you to suffer like this. He says, Hey, Jesus, I know you've got this plan to establish your kingdom, but all these nations already belong to me. But I'll tell you what, if, if you, you know, your father's got a plan, but I don't think it's going to work. I've got an idea for it. Just, just bow down and worship me, Jesus, and I'll give you all these kingdoms. He's constantly saying, just, Forget about what God says. Don't trust what God says. Let's try another way. And it never works. It's never for our good. It might look like it works in worldly terms, but it always leads to death and destruction. He's not only the tempter, he's, he's also the accuser. Again, Revelation 14, he just the, the serpent, the dragon, is, is called the accuser of the brethren. But then in, in Zechariah uh, chapter 3, it's hard to flip through the minor prophets because they're so small. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1. Zechariah sees a vision. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. All right, so, so at this point, Satan has given up on lying in this vision. Now he's telling the truth, some of the truth, partial truth. This man's a sinner, God. He's done this. He's done that. So the other thing, he hasn't loved you with all his heart, much less his mind and his strength. He hasn't loved his neighbor as himself. He's unclean. He's impure. He's unfit to stand in your presence, God. But the Lord answers Satan, Zechariah 3.2, 
The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. Satan's not lying about the iniquities of Joshua, the high priest here in the vision. And and when he accuses us, he's he's not wrong about the sins that we've committed. We are sinners. And and on our own, we are condemned before the Lord. But Jesus has defeated the devil's accusations, not, not by denying them, but by cleansing us from them. We're a brand plucked from the fire. We, we were in the fire. We were destined to be burned, but we've been snatched out. And, and our, our garments are, are polluted and stained with our sins, but Jesus has taken them away from us and clothed us with clean garments and in a clean turban, with pure vestments, with his own righteous works. So Satan has no accusations left that he can make against us. They've all been taken away. And while he continues to tempt us in this life, he can't conquer us through his temptations because Jesus continues to protect us and his spirit continues to guide us. He brings us to repentance when we do sin, when we do give in to the temptations. And the day is coming when Satan will be cast down, cast into the pit of darkness, cast ultimately into the lake of fire and consumed. And he will never tempt us or anyone else ever again. It's it's a John writes in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. That the world is, is bought into Satan's temptations. If the world believes that if there is a God, if this is his word, then he doesn't have our best interests at heart. Through his death and through his resurrection, Jesus has destroyed the power of Satan. And Satan is being brought to nothing. It's going to be made a part of Christ's footstool. And then not just Satan, not just the devil, but the world is an enemy of Christ that is going to be put under his feet, brought into subjection. All right, and, and again, we, we see how these flow into each other. We, we just saw 1 John 5, 19, that the world lies under the power of the evil one, but we can still distinguish the world from Satan. And the world is, is full of rules and authorities and powers, of systems and of worldviews. And the world some some of the things in the world in and of themselves are horrifically sinful. Some of the things in the world in and of themselves would be perfectly acceptable, except that they do not submit themselves to God's law. And so they stand in opposition to Him. And, and they're going to be brought, again, to, to nothing. The, 
the, the world is one of the major methods that Satan uses to tempt people. Tell you that, well, well, this is what everyone else is doing. For, I mean, advertising for, for Chinese people will tell you that a billion people can't be wrong. Right? Rice has to be good. Um, like, I, I do like Chinese food. But just because there's a billion people that like this or seven billion people that like that and approve of that doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it true. It doesn't make it just. And that's one of the great dangers of living in a democracy. So we can get this idea that the truth and morality are determined by a majority. And they're not. Truth and righteousness are determined by God. Even, even if the whole world stands against God. Let God be true and every man a liar. So the world, under the influence of Satan, seeks goals outside of Christ. Seeks to establish its own happiness and its own security. And it doesn't submit to God's law. But Jesus overcomes the world. And again, 1 John uh, chapter 5, verse 4 tells us that this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Son of God has overcome the world. So Jesus, through faith and through the faith of His people, and through the faith of, of His church overcomes the world. It, it endure, the church endures and perseveres and survives and, and at the end of days it's not going to be the United States that's the last empire standing. And it's not going to be a resurgent Soviet Union. It's, it's not going to be China. It's not going to be the European Union or the World Economic Forum or a New World Order. All those nations and all those powers will be brought to nothing. There will be the kingdom of God and only the kingdom of God. And what that means for us as, as citizens in the world means that our ultimate allegiance must always be to Christ above all earthly powers, and kingdoms, and parties. C.S. Lewis warned uh, in, in his book, The Screwtape Letters, that the, one of the temptations of, of Satan is to first try to convince a man that he should support a particular cause because he's convinced it's, it's Christian, but then try to flip them in the person's mind. So, so you get a person started to believe in pacifism, um, or patriotism, it doesn't matter which, but you convince them that they're a pacifist because they're a Christian. But you get them so focused on pacifism that eventually they become convinced that they should be Christian just because Christianity supports pacifism. Or they should be Christians because Christianity supports their patriotism. Or you should encourage people to be Christians because Christianity supports the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. Or, or whatever else. Satan and the world want us to value these other things. These worldly things. And to see religion as, as merely a means to that end. Whereas our right understanding should be in that Christ is the center of all things. And that we, we will live as Christian citizens in this world. And we will support policies and, and parties as far as they're in agreement with Christ's word. And not a step further. 
and, and at this time, it's, it's not hard to see that one party is far, far further removed from God's word than the other in our country. But we, we can't equate Christianity with the conservative movement or, or Christianity with the Republican Party. Parties change. Christ and his kingdom do not. We have to be willing to say to, to the entire world that these things you value, these things you care about, are not of ultimate value. That we don't need the honors, we don't need the success, we don't need the riches and the possessions that the world offers us because we have a better inheritance. We have a heavenly city, a heavenly kingdom, and an eternal inheritance. And that faith, that faith in the promises of God overcomes the world. And then the third rule and authority and power, the third enemy that Jesus Christ overcomes. And, and I left it for third for a reason, because I think it's the most dangerous to us, is the flesh. Our flesh. Our earthly human nature, corrupted by the fall, is opposed to God. So again, Paul writes to, to the Romans that the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's laws. All right, and, and again, these are all these are all connected. All right, our flesh is influenced by the world. That well, these are the things we ought to value, and these are the things we we ought not to value. Our, our minds and our flesh are, are influenced by the temptations of, of Satan. But we can't blame everything on society. They didn't make us this way. Um, we, we can't blame everything on, well, the devil made me do it. The, the, the fact is that our flesh is opposed to God, that we have longings, desires, passions for things that we ought not to have. Things which are not part of God's perfect design for us. Things are not part of God's perfect will. Things which have to be brought in subjection to Christ. It, it's, it's the flesh that leads me to want to rage against everybody on the road who impedes my progress ever so slightly. They're driving too slow. They're driving too fast. They're not signaling soon enough. They're, they're signaling too soon. They, they're slowing down too much to make this turn. You know, they're taking this turn at an absurd rate of whatever. If, right, that's my selfishness. It, it, it's not... It's not something I can blame on anybody else. And it needs to be put to death that Christ might live in us. And, and Jesus conquers our flesh through his spirit. So Paul can write in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It's how in, in John 3, we can read about how we have to be born of water and of the Spirit. It's how Ezekiel can prophesy in, in Ezekiel 36 that God will remove the heart of stone that is in our flesh and give us a heart of flesh. And he will write our commandment, his commandments on our hearts and make us careful to walk in his statutes and observe his, his rules. If we're in Christ, we are a new creation. We've been united with him in his death. We are being united with him in his resurrection. 
we are receiving a new nature that is being continually renewed after the image of its creator. The Holy Spirit continues to work upon us the, the ordinary means of grace through the church continue to work upon us the reading of the word, the singing of the word, the praying of the word, the preaching of the word, and the ordinances of the word. Ephesians 4, 12 says that God gave apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry until everyone achieves to the unity of the faith and to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That, that's what the church is doing in us by the Spirit, through the Word. So, so even when it, when it seems like well, nothing's happening at our church, if, if we are being daily more and more conformed to the image of Christ, if the old self is being put off and, and the new self is being put on, if our impatience and our self-centeredness and, and, and our lusts, our worldliness is, is being killed, and Christ-likeness is being developed, then, then the church is serving its purpose. And Christ is having the victory. So Jesus is destroying every rule and every authority and every power. They're, they're not completely destroyed yet. He's destroying the devil. He's destroying the world. The system of this world. And, and he's destroying our flesh. In verse 25, for he must reign until he's put all his enemies under his, his feet. And that, that all there means all. all right, it, it's, it's not just that, well, he's, he's going to rescue his people from his enemies, set them up in their own little safe enclave while the rest of the world outside continues to do its thing. All his enemies will be put under his feet. There's, there's, right, in every, every conflict in our world, there's belligerents and there are neutrals, right? So, so even in the middle of World War II, when all of Europe and almost the entire world is at war, here's Switzerland in the middle of it, is saying, no, we don't want to have anything to do with this. Just leave us alone. and We're just going to continue banking and making watches and chocolate. All right, with, with the current conflict between Ukraine and, and Russia, even, even as we're sending $54 billion to Ukraine, we're saying that oh, we don't want to actually get involved in this. That's not an option with the kingdom of, of God. There, there is no neutrality. There are his enemies and, and there are his, his subjects. And so, we can't live our lives thinking that, well, this, this isn't really a big concern of mine. And, and even more so, the people around us, the people who, who are hostile to the gospel, we, we can't just say that, well, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian, and I think this is really important to me, but if you don't think it's important, then, well, okay. I mean, we're, we're not talking about, you know, sports where it's okay if someone doesn't care about baseball. Maybe it's good for you if you don't care about baseball at all. Probably it's. Um, or, or, you know, fitness or cooking or what, you know, it's, it's not something where, well, I, I just love everything you can do with spices and cooking. It's okay if you don't care about that stuff. No, this, this is 
eternity, and this is everything. And, and it's our charge as citizens of the kingdom of God, as ambassadors for Christ, to tell people that they are enemies of God. And that God is giving them this opportunity to repent and to be delivered from their sins and to be reconciled to Him. And that if they refuse to be reconciled, that they are going to be destroyed. Philippians 2 writes about how at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Some of those knees are going to bow in reverence and worship, and some of those knees are going to bow because they've been broken with a rod of iron. And we, we can't force people to believe this gospel. We, we can't compel people to accept the grace of Christ. But we need to do everything we can to, to make sure that they've heard the message and that they know how important it is. And that it is going to affect them. And then verse 26 says, The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And the reason why death is, is the last enemy to be destroyed is because death is the result of sin. Romans 5 puts it very clearly that, that sin came into the world through Adam and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because of all sin. All right. Paul makes the same point, 1 Corinthians 15, 21. God wasn't lying when he told the man that on the day you eat of it, dying, you shall die. And so for the, the only way for death to be destroyed is for the cause of death to be removed. And, and so when sin is no more, because the devil is no more, because the sinful world is no more, because our sinful flesh is no more, then death will be no more. That's how we're delivered from this body of death and from this world of death. We, we can already say, by faith in, in Christ, that it is not death to die. But in the last day, death will be no more. It's already lost its power. It's going to lose its existence over us. We will live forever. We will live life as it was meant to be lived in the presence of God in fullness of joy. And then verses 27 and 28 gives another great opportunity for theologians to spill ink over and accuse one another of being heretics. Because as Jesus reigns over all things, he also subjects himself to the Father. Verse 27, For God has put all things in subjection under his feet, but when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. So God the Father has put all things in subjection under God the Son's feet. But God the Father is not a part of that all things that are subjected to the Son. When all things are subjected to him, the Son, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him, the Father, who put all things in subjection under him, the Son, that God may be all in all. So, the 
Yeah. Preachers, theologians go to great lengths to try to explain this and how you can explain this without denying this or affirming that or one or the other or something without saying that the Son is inferior to the Father. She's not inferior to the Father. They'll try to say something like, well, it's, it's only the, the human nature of the Son that's subjected to the Father, which is then dividing the person of Christ. So there's errors abounding on every side here. And I think we fall into those errors when we try to explain things that God has not explained. The Trinity is a mystery. We accept what has been revealed by faith and, and we accept that there are aspects of the Trinity that we cannot comprehend. But what is clear in these verses is that the Son is going to subject Himself to the Father. That there's not three heavenly kingdoms where the Father reigns here and then the Son reigns here and the Holy Spirit reigns over there. They're not competing against one another. They're not even like our states theoretically do in, in a, a confederation where they're cooperating with each other. They, they're unified, united with one another. With the Son subjected to the Father so that God may be all in all. Um, there's a perfect unity of will between the Father, Son, and Spirit. There's, there's an agreement of purpose. There's a sharing of, of majesty, a sharing of authority, a sharing of power, so that God may be all in all. And I wanted to conclude this, this verse with, with just quoting at some length from John Gill, Baptist preacher in England, 1700s. This is what John Gill wrote. For by God is not meant the Father personally, but God essentially considered, Father, Son, and Spirit, who are the one true and living God, to whom all the saints will have immediate access, in whose presence they will be, and with whom they shall have uninterrupted fellowship, without the use of such mediums as they now enjoy. All three divine persons will have equal power and government in and over all the saints. They will sit upon one and the same throne, there will be no more acting by a delegated power or a derived authority. God will be all things to all his saints immediately without the use of means. He will be that to their bodies as meat and clothes are without the use of them. And all light, glory, and happiness to their souls without the use of ordinances or any means. He will then be all perfection and bliss to all the elect and in them all which he now is not some are dead in trespasses and sins, and under the power of Satan. The number of them in conversion is not yet completed. And of those that are called, many are in a state of imperfection, and have flesh as well as spirit in them. And of those who are fallen asleep in Christ, though their separate spirits are happy with Him, yet their bodies lie in the grave, and under the power of corruption and death. But then all being called by grace and all being raised and glorified in soul and body, God will be all in all. This phrase expresses both the perfect government of God, Father, Son, and Spirit over the saints to all eternity and their perfect happiness in soul and body, the glory of all which will be ascribed to God. And it will be then seen that all that the Father has done in election in the council and covenant of peace were all to the glory of His grace. And that all that the Son has done in the salvation of His people is all to the glory of the divine perfections. And that all that the Spirit of God has wrought in the saints and all that they have done under His grace and influence are all to the praise and glory of God. 
which will, in the most perfect manner, be given to the eternal three in one. God will be all in all. When his kingdom is perfectly established, when all things are subjected to the Son, when the Son is subjected to the Father, and without, without the use of means, you, you won't have to partake of the Lord's Supper to partake of the Lord. You, you won't need to. That there aren't going to be any preachers in the kingdom of God. That there will be preachers, I hope, who have made it into the kingdom of God. But we're not going to be preaching sermons. We're going to be enjoying the direct presence of the triune God. There will be perfection and bliss forever and ever. This is what God will do. What remains for us and what remains for the world is to decide do we want to submit ourselves to God's government? Do we want to rejoice at His rule and submit ourselves to it? And enjoy it thereby? Or do we want to rebel and rage and resist the rule of God? Our, our culture has, has made an idol out of rebellion and resistance. There's no virtue in resisting the kingdom of God. There's no hope in resisting the kingdom of God. There's no joy in resisting the kingdom of God. He's a perfect king. So let us submit ourselves to him and let us call others to do the same. Let's not tolerate, especially, let's not tolerate any rebellion against him in our own lives. Can you pray with me? Father, we ask for more grace. We pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. We long for the day when all rebellion against you has ceased, not only in the world around us, but especially within us. Conform us to the image of your Son, our great King, Jesus. It's in his name that we pray this. Amen. as we